Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. I'm sorry, I forgot how we say in German. Guten Abend. Um, Herzlich willkommen. <laughs> so we're um, letting people uh, get in. Um, we're very happy to be with you today. There's still people coming in, so we'll wait one minute um, as people are entering. Sorry also for the slight delay in opening the room. That's uh, we had some technical problems. Um, who would have believed after two years of Corona? Uh, I take it on me, sorry. All good, we're almost all here. <laughs> and we can start the conversation. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm very uh, pleased today, although it's uh, again for, you know, terrible things happening uh, here in Palestine. Um, my name is Ines Abdraze. I'm the advocacy director for a Palestinian independent uh, organization called the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy. I'm joining you from Jerusalem today. I am joined uh, by um, Ms. Asil el Bajje, who's an advocacy officer and legal researcher at the human rights organization Al Haq. Um, Asil, I think you're joining us also from Palestine. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, Ms. Francesca Albanese, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Very welcome to you, Francesca. Uh, we, I'm also joined by Riyad Osman, who's the nearest advisor at Medico International, uh, an organization uh, in Germany. And we'll be joined shortly uh, by Henriette Westrin, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, who's the Secretary General of Norwegian People's Aid. Um, and tonight we have convened this rather you know, urgent and short notice meeting and briefing and discussion uh, in order to discuss the latest assault and the escalation that has been taking place against Palestinian. Um, civil society organizations. Um, so I'll briefly uh, remind you the fact and so uh, and give you a couple of housekeeping um, you know, information. Um, so there will not be a, a proper Q&A today. I think it's, this is just a one hour conversation. We'll be together uh, just uh, 60 minutes and uh, the different panelists will give uh, you know, their perspective on a, a different um, you know, dimensions of what we're facing at the moment. And uh, if you have any pressing question, if you really want to ask some question uh, to the panelists, I'll be uh, taking some as we are uh, discussing together. And so you can ask them in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and so feel free to write them uh, in the question uh, section. Um, so, yeah, so... Basically, we're here today because uh, on Thursday uh, morning, uh, the Israeli army uh, raided and assaulted in the middle of Ramallah, uh, seven uh, human rights, uh, but also civil society uh, organizations in general, who are doing tremendous work in Palestine around a socioeconomic issue, human rights issues. Um, they've raided their offices, they've uh, forcibly closed their offices, they've stolen some material. Uh, this is just the latest escalation into a uh, longer trend into criminalizing and uh, trying to prevent Palestinian organizations from doing their work. Um, and so this is also exactly why I want to start with Asil today. Uh, Asil, so you're working for Al Haq, one of the organizations uh, that has been under attack that continues to be under attack that uh, is you know under heightened risk of uh, the staff being arrested. Uh, can you please uh, tell us a bit about uh, you know what happened, but also what does it mean for uh, your work and why do you think uh, Israel is cracking down uh, on your work uh, now? Um. Thank you, Ines, for the introduction, and thank you, Medico, for organizing this um, webinar. 
Um, I might start with what happened and then we could go through the context through which this latest attack has, um, has been uh, ongoing for decades, actually. Um, and as you mentioned, it, um, it was a week ago that our offices were raided, seven organizations, seven Palestinian society organizations were raided um, and materials were um, either confiscated or damaged, um, as well as a military order was affixed to each of the seven organizations um, demanding the closure of our um, organization because as per the military order, our um, operation is basically illegal. Um, and this has been operating or um, this follows a year of um, uh, building on and a year of uh, attacks um, starting from October last year, whereby Minister um, of Defense Benny Gantz announced or designated six organizations as terrorist organization under Israel's domestic law. Um, and basically this law is first of all, illegally applied to Palestinian civil society registered under Palestinian uh, basic law and operating in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, and the law itself is also problematic in how it has very broad provisions of what constitutes terrorism basically, and it entails very dangerous complications on the staff and the operation of the six organizations, varying from imprisonment of the staff of the organization. And this could lead actually to 25 years of imprisonment to the senior positions in the organization and down to five years of imprisonment for, um, for other um, staff of the seven, six organizations. We're talking also about some of the consequences of this designation is that our uh, work is basically an asset um, is illegible as per this um, um, uh, designation for confiscation. And we are also um, under threat of being uh, closed. Um, and actually this designation was followed by military orders from the military commander, which gives the same effect to the designation. Um, and uh, the interesting part about, not interesting, but the um, different approach Israel has used in this October designation, because this is a long-term campaign to suppress and silence uh, the voices of human rights defenders, is, is that it was trying to attack the donors and the friends and the supporters and the international community of Palestinian civil society by having these specific provisions in the law, which says that also the supporters of the organizations um, are deemed illegal uh, through their um, supporting the organization. And Israel was thinking that with this designation, it could intimidate um, the donors and it could pressure the donors and the partners to basically stop the funding. So eventually we are not operating anymore as six organization. Um, the interesting part is that we have been receiving more support as Palestinian civil society from our civil society, civil society organization around the globe, from governments, from um, uh, the donors and partners. Um, there's been le uh, levels of um, support. Um, and, and, and the most important part that the, the, the um, funding continued uh, throughout the, the last year. Um, now, unfortunately, now I think it should be important to analyze or to put this designation also into the bigger context that the Palestinian civil society are operating under. So we're not talking about Israel attacking civil society and this is happening in a vacuum. We're talking about a systematic regime of suppression against any voice that tries to basically challenge or oppose or resist um, this settler colonial and apartheid regime that has been operating for 74 years against Palestinian people as a whole. So whether you're a Palestinian or you are a foreigner and you're trying to advocate for Palestinian rights throughout different tools, whether through advocacy or whether through um, activism, whether you are a student doing student organizing, every single act that tries to oppose this, this regime is basically um, suppressed and silenced. Um, and so, for example, if we want to talk about these specific military orders, we're talking about thousands or um, I think 1,800 military orders that has been issued throughout the 50 years of occupation that basically criminalize uh, and suppress uh, the freedom of expression of Palestinians, the freedom of association of Palestinians, nonviolent protests, uh, and even sometimes um, your freedom of expression on social media through a post could be criminalized yeah. under these military orders. 
Um, so this is the context we're talking about um, um, that fits into the bigger question of suppression of Palestinian people as a whole. And this takes different forms, like the, the laws and the policies and the military orders are actually designed to suppress Palestinian opposition and resistance. And, and it takes the form into, for example, uh, killing of Palestinians, the, the arbitrary detention, the torture of Palestinians, the uh, suppression of protests, the, the actually the blockade of the Gaza Strip as a collective punishment actually takes the form or Israel um, labels it as a uh, security measure. Um, and so all of these policies are actually part of the bigger regime. And so suppressing Palestinian civil society is yet another tool for Israel to continue its crimes and violations without being challenged and without uh, having to pay the price for this. Um, so I think this is the, the bigger context where um, we're operating under and these attacks are operating under. And I think um, the main reason it is attacking these organizations, which actually also um, uh, implicates an attack on all Palestinian civil society, is because of the core work we do on a daily basis. So, For example, for al Haq, uh, which is the first human rights organization in not only in Palestine, but in the Middle East, we have been for 40 years or more um, documenting human rights violations on the ground um, and, and collecting testimonies from the people on the different violations they are subjected to, trying with these documentation to first of all expose this to the international community and to, to the world of what is happening in Palestine, but also to put that into its context that I've been um, talking about. We have been also trying to challenge Israel's impunity through accountability mechanisms, including, for example, at the International Criminal Court by engaging and cooperating with the court and providing legal evidence and, and the substantive information we collect from the field, from the, from the people. We have been also trying to challenge the uh, role of businesses, for example, in sustaining this illegal occupation um, uh, throughout their operations in, with, uh, with or in the illegal settlements. So this is the kind of work we uh, we do as al haq for example, but other organizations designated, for example, as al damir um, has been also specifically mandated to protect Palestinian political prisoners by, by doing also advocacy, accountability work, providing legal services to prisoners. Other organizations are working on issues related to women's rights, socioeconomic rights, natural resources. Uh, DCI, for example, Defense for Children International is working on rights of uh, Palestinian children uh, through advocacy and through um, other means. So basically by Israel, by saying these organizations um, are uh, issuing these military orders and saying um, um, these are uh, terrorist organizations under this terrorist law, it wants to evade accountability and it wants to evade uh, the exposure of its ongoing and daily human rights violations against the Palestinian people. And um, it doesn't want actually to be challenged, uh, uh, its action. And I think the, the, the other thing that we're not talking also about is that it's trying to destruct the whole Palestinian civil society, basically, and isolate it from the global human rights movement. And because we're talking about... Um, our organization working on, on mandates of international law and rule of law and human rights, which are universal principles. Uh, then Israel, when it is attacking us, it is also attacking every single, uh, whether human rights organization or state or individual who is committed to these universal principles. So it, it is actually trying to make Palestinian civil society and Palestine as a whole as an exception from the bigger uh, context we're operating because liberation in Palestine or the, the realization of our rights as collective people uh, will not be fulfilled if other issues of uh, global injustices are also going on around the globe. Um, I think, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Asil. This is, um, this is really important. You said very important thing, but I'll automatically, uh, immediately go to Francesca and actually coming from what Asil just said, because what's interesting is um, Israel has been criminalizing any form of, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian um, uh, political dissent or human rights work in order uh, to shield themselves from accountability. 
And yet what we see with this uh, accusation and criminalization of these organizations is that Israel knows that it can do, you know, it can escalate um, the, the attacks against these NGOs because it benefits from uh, impunity. Because after the designation, although, you know, European countries um, didn't follow through yet, there was never a, any accountability or actions taken uh, to hold Israel accountable. And I think uh, here, uh, I want to hear more about your legal analysis, because uh, it's very clear that these, uh, you know, the cracking down on these organizations is uh, illegal under international law. So can you explain a bit more, you know, from a legal perspective, what it means? And, and, and most of all, because a lot of European, uh, you know, uh, government officials or European uh, practitioners are, are listening to us. What does it mean? What what are the international obligations of, of these uh, third parties uh, and actors? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much uh, to you for and for inviting me. Um, I think that Asil provided a fair, fairly comprehensive uh, overview, and probably just to complement what she said, uh, the problem. I agree that the problem is with the counterterrorism. Uh, Law, which gave room, which allowed for the designation as a terrorist organization of uh, of uh, renowned Palestinian human rights uh, actors. Um, and on, on top of what Asil said, uh, there is uh, in the in the in the designation and in the legislation itself a, a, a problem of due process because the. Um, something that was not mentioned is that uh, the designation of, uh, of terrorism not only is broad and vague, but it also is based is often based on secret evidence that uh, the designated organization could not challenge. Um, nonetheless, there have been numerous investigations recently. We came to know also from the CIA that couldn't find any evidence in uh, supporting what um, what Israel maintains that these organizations are part and parcel of a terrorist uh, endeavor in, uh, in occupied Palestine. Um, so this, uh, the, for, for what concerns the, the, the complementing legal analysis, I mean, this whole designation is wrong in many ways. And it's an infringement of, um, of a number of critical human rights uh, obligations that Israel has has, uh, because as an occupying power, as still an occupying power after 55 years, and then this is a separate discussion that must take place, but Israel is, uh, is um, obliged to respect and ensure, fulfill and protect freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association of the occupied population, and these freedoms have, are clearly curtailed uh, through, these, uh, through these actions, through the designation, through the persecution of Palestinian civil society. And all the more here there is a, a suppression of, um, of human rights defenders. Uh, I'm, I was pleased to be part of a group of uh, human um, special rapporteurs and new UN experts who condemned these, these actions as uh, curtailing uh, the civic space that exists for, for Palestinian civil society, which is what remains for the protection of the Palestinians under an illegal, an illegal occupation, because this is eventually what it, what it is about. Uh, there is a tendency in the occupied territory to look at each incident as if it was an isolated case, but no, it emanates from an occupation which we have stopped questioning, but why Israel has still troops on the ground, in uh, boots on the ground in the West Bank, why it's trying to annex is Jerusalem, why it keeps Gaza under blockade. The Palestinians have the right of self-determination and this is something for immediate execution. It's not something that needs to wait or needs to be negotiated by the Palestinians and Israel. It's, it's a right and it should be, it should be respected. So, on top of the severe infringement of freedom of expression and in freedom of association and persecution of human rights defenders, which incidentally, it's itself part and parcel of the crime of apartheid under the, um, the, the, the apartheid convention, um, article two. 
there, this is also part of a systematic and widespread illegality that again pertains with an occupation that has no raison d'être. Why it's there in the first place after 55 years? It's not temporary. It's not carried out in the best interest of the occupied population. It's there to stay, as demonstrated by the attempt to, um, to, to annex large swaths of land that are part of the 61% of uh, the West Bank under um, direct control of the of Israel as the occupying power. So when I'm saying that because it leads to the next point, you ask me what are the responsibility of the international community? The international community must first and foremost um, get the diagnosis right. So look at uh, the reality in the OPT, not as a series of unrelated occasional violations. It's a systematic, uh, so sorry, it's a situation marked by profound and systematic illegality. Um, and this is what is to be addressed. Uh, this is what is to be condemned and this is what is to be responded to with concrete actions. Uh, because the, um, the violation of peremptory norms of international law, which means norms that must be respected above all, that cannot be derogated, um, is something that concerns the whole international community, not Israel. The right of self-determination of the Palestinian people is an obligation that um, the moment Israel doesn't comply, the moment Israel violates that right of the Palestinian people, automatically, the other states are responsible to make sure that that right is realized. And this has clearly not happened. So what should happen now is to, to make good use of the package of measures that the UN Charter offers. Uh, use uh, um, diplomatic, political, and economic measures to put pressure on Israel to comply. I mean, I, it doesn't take a genius to, to understand that when there is a violation, then the law must apply. Because um, otherwise we create a system that is imperfect, not in nature, not conceptually, but in the way this is executed. And it makes just, uh, it gives a reason to other states to behave in the same disrespectful uh, fashion. Thank you very much for this. Uh, yes, this indeed uh, sobering picture, and um, and I think you you both uh, reminded the, of the bigger picture that often is 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 forgotten, and uh, we have to remind that a lot of the you know in there, the international consensus, uh, human rights consensus uh, that follows uh, again decades of Palestinian analysis and legal analysis uh, is you know uh, describing the reality as one of apartheid. And I think what's important here is that, you know, instead of actually trying to uh, discuss uh, how to actually end apartheid and the occupation, um, Israel has been trying to cut, uh, you know, Palestinian efforts to, uh, to defend themselves, to end the occupation uh, from international solidarity by defining the agenda. And I think uh, the global, you know, I think the, the global uh, uh, situation we're in uh, Israel has understood that it could uh, take advantage of that. And so I think the situation we're in is that you have organizations that have to defend themselves from not being terrorists. You have solidarity groups that have to defend themselves from not being anti-Semitic. And I think this has been a deliberate strategy to equate uh, criticism of Israel uh, work on the ground with either terrorism or with uh, you know, an anti-Semitism. It's extremely uh, you know, problematic because this one uh, defines the agenda on the terms of, of the Israeli, which is a bad faith you know, occupation. And also it means that we're here on a defensive mode instead of doing the work that we should be doing uh, to end this, uh, you know, this injustice and the unequal uh, ruling and the unjust uh, and unfair system we live in. So what's interesting now to, to explore is, okay, what has been the, uh, the European uh, response? And I'll turn to Yuriad, uh, 
especially talking, you know, from a German perspective, which is a particularly difficult, I think, context. Um, we've seen that, you know, uh, the EU, nine EU member states, uh, including uh, Germany, have uh, stated that they will continue to support these organizations, that they will continue to fund them. Uh, however, they've done so in terms of, uh, uh, you know, placing the argument into the lack of evidence. So instead of, you know, uh, dismissing the allegations uh, that come from uh, a military uh, occupation uh, and that are already illegal actions, they have taken seriously, you know, these allegations and reviewing some form of evidence that, that doesn't exist. And we've seen that the impunity has continued, right? I mean, we've seen the German Minister of Interior visiting recently and signing further uh, security agreements with Israel. I mean, the you know the relationship with Israel continues to grow and the impunity continues to grow. How do you see uh, this from a you know a, a perspective of an NGO that works with some of the Palestinian NGOs that are under attack? How does it impact your work and your ability to operate uh, in your own country? Uh, thanks for the question, um, Ines. Yeah, well, uh, it is it is complicated, as you said already. Uh, let's let's maybe start with the with the easier part of the question, which I feel is more the legal part or the practical part about how it affects our operations there and here. Um, and then we come to the more complicated political part, and I'll try to be brief on this one. Um, so, so the legal aspects uh, so far, in, in the absence, as you said, as Francesca and, and uh, Asil also rightly said, in the absence of any evidence, uh, there, is no, there is no legal risk emanating from the German legal system or European anti-terror uh, legislation. None of the organizations and none of the individuals in the organizations are listed terrorist by any other by any other uh, entity than the state of Israel. So uh, pretty much we carry the same risk as other international actors. Um, Asil already mentioned for Palestinians, uh, according to the Israeli anti counter counterterrorism law, this can carry sentences up to 25 uh, years in jail. For us, this is much less, you know, for identifying with uh, with these uh, designated organizations, it's up to three years for providing resources as we do through our funding, uh, it can be up to five years. Uh, but to, to, to be realistic, I mean, this, this would not only go for NGOs or German political foundations, I mean, this is taxpayers' money. So how realistic is it that the Israeli state comes after German decision makers or even after German staff on the ground, uh, which is also being debated among German uh, institutions, how, how high the risk is for our employees, especially for our Palestinian employees. And honestly, I do not see, uh, I mean, of course, I see the legal threat in principle, according to the very vague Israeli counterterrorism law of 2016, but I don't see an immediate risk. This is not about us mainly. Um, at least not about us as German NGOs or German political foundations. This is about Palestinian uh, organizations and uh, undermining the, the work, the documentation of these rights breaches, et cetera, as it's already been, been said. Um, the, the, the thing is um, here, um, the, the, the question would be how, how bad is the situation going to become? And I think this largely depends on the on the further response, uh, how resolute and determined that response will be. And I'm not talking only about a German response, because I think the Germans, as you said, uh, due due to their very special relations to the state of Israel and German Jewish history, uh, genocidal history, obviously they would be spearheading a more resolute response. They might join one if it's being spearheaded by other European countries like uh, like uh, France and maybe some of the Scandinavian countries or, or whoever else. Um, my impression is that the 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 very hesitant reaction to the designations of October two thousand twenty one emboldened the Israeli government. Had there been a resolution. Uh, had, had there been a resolute response back then that this is unacceptable as they've by the way said now i mean you you must you must give them that the uh, that the current statement 
is much sharper in tone than the last one. The last one didn't say, I, I think actually from the Germans, there wasn't even their own, um, uh, their own statement against those designations. They took very long. And I think what then was the result of them uh, verifying the, the Israeli dossier uh, was essentially the joint statement of those nine EU member states, which was more soft-spoken than what they what they've published now um i feel that if they uh if they continue to basically merely condemn uh the israeli actions and not uh basically not not talk about further consequences except for temporarily soured relations because what is maybe perceived to be a too uh, a too tough statement then i think the escalation will continue say the european countries just continue to fund then i think we're going to see those arrests of course i mean closing the offices and leaving a military order based based on an ordinance of emergency regulations of 1945 by the british uh, in the first place, what what kind of uh, what's what's the basis uh, for this? Uh, what, what's the understanding of a state that usually portrays itself as the only democracy in the Middle East? It's of course largely anti-democratic. Um, that when 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 the same uh, state and and here I get back to what you also said earlier, what Asil said in the beginning. I also see that this is not merely. Uh, against the work of the affected six Palestinian organizations. I mean, we as Medico, we support Al Haq, and we support the uh, Union of Agricultural Work Committees and the struggle for Palestinian land and water rights in Area C of the West Bank. Um, but the the I mean the the blow against the European Union is I think quite uh, quite clear. And it's, it follows a certain tradition that we've also been observing over the past couple of years. If you look at the alliances that the Netanyahu government has been has been crafting with illiberal uh, political forces abroad, uh, like of course Trump and Bolsonaro uh, in the Americas, uh, Orban and Kaczynski uh, here, but also uh, the the, uh, the the Austrian government. Uh, one two years back, so so these were uh, anti EU, anti anti liberal, and in uh, some parts one cannot uh, say it in in other terms than openly anti Semitic uh, political forces, and uh, that that didn't uh, that didn't affect them uh, very much. So um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll 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 leave it at that. I do not I do not think that due to a german decision by the government we will run out of funds at the moment so this is not my worry it's really more my worry that uh, the uh, that the israeli side will manage to practically make work there impossible mm -hmm. by all the action it has taken over the past couple of months especially to 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 try and achieve a full control over the organizations that constitute a very central part of what I would consider the the, the uh, progressive progressive bits of Palestinian civil society, and there are two things I need to say, uh, because I think it it was uh, it was not uh, I think it might have been a misunderstanding. Uh, the event was not only is not only being hosted by uh, Medico International just for the audience. It's also hosted by Norwegian People's Aid. So I'm very happy that Henriette is with us as the Secretary General. And I'd also like to send out some greetings and thanks to our executive, Medico's executive director, Safriya Kohn, who's now in the audience. He's invisible, but he's there, uh, who's been very supportive of this event. So thank you uh, also for that. Thank you, Riyad. I think you make a, you know, an important reminder um, in a context where I think, you know, uh, we won't name and shame anyone, but it's clear that in Germany it's been very difficult to speak out. Uh, a lot of the organizations uh, today cannot, you know, come out and don't want to come out and speak out uh, about Palestine because there's an automatic crackdown, uh, you know, of accusation of being anti-Semitic, a chilling effect, and I think this is this is where I want to. I think turn to to Henriette. Uh, thank you very much for being with us from from Norway. Um, you know, there is a clear political dimension. It's not it's not a legal issue because, as we said, 
uh, these, uh, you know, these accusations, uh, these false allegations, and and the, and the disinformation has been going on for a while, and trying to to really, uh, I think, uh, discourage international actors and international civil society from working with um, with Palestinians. And so, with you know, with your uh, experience uh, in Norway, how? How have you been, you know, feeling in the past years? Like, have you feel felt more under scrutiny? Have you received any attacks? Because there are, you know, certain numbers of groups that call themselves, you know, NGOs that are, you know, uh, working to to spread smearing and disinformation, sending, uh, you know, false reports to international actors, parliaments, uh, governments about Palestinian, uh, you know, Palestinian civil society, Palestinian actors. Uh, how how are you operating in this context, and and can you tell us a bit more about your experience now as a again an international partner of Palestinian uh, civil society? Yeah, sure. I would love to do. Thank you so much, uh, Ines. Uh, and I would like to first say thank you so much to Riyadh and Medical International to inviting us uh, to join and to host this meeting because. For NPA, it's really, really important to have close international cooperation with different uh, European, uh, American, and other organizations who are working uh, in Palestine so that we actually can share experiences and learn from each other how to, to meet the challenges that we are facing. Because, of course, uh, the short way of answering your question is yes, we have experienced all the things that, uh, that you are saying. Uh, and I think maybe I should just start with a very, very short presentation of NPA. We are uh, the Norwegian Labour Movement, Solidarity and Humanitarian Organization. We work in more than 30 countries, uh, and we have been in Palestine since uh, the first Intifada in 1987. Uh, we always uh, say that we take stands in conflicts. We do work humanitarian, but we also work politically where we say that we should join people. Uh, and Palestine is not one of our economically largest programs, but I think I'll say that it's by far uh, the most important political program. It takes a lot of resources on the political level, and it takes a lot of resources to understand all the time, how can we continue to work there? Uh, and how should we, uh, do our programming in a way that we can continue being uh, a safe political support, but still survive as a legal organization uh, in Palestine. Uh, we have our head office uh, in Gaza, and we have had so uh, all the times. Today, we are a partner with uh, Wawak, um, and we have also before had several of those six uh, as partners. And we work together with many organizations like Al Haq, who will come and visit us in Norway in September, which we really uh, look forward to. But I'll also say that uh, I fully agree about uh, what has been said that uh, it's definitely nothing new what we see today. And the terror designation is just the latest in a long series of attacks on civil society organizations, both in Palestine and in Israel. And we have for several years experienced, of course, uh, lots of pressure in the Norwegian debate, but we've been quite relaxed to that. I think that there's no problem that we have to stand up for our opinions and explain why we do what we do. And we have like the muscles to stand in these public debates. But we have also seen uh, a lot of pressure directly from the Israeli um, governments uh, in different ways. Uh, the first uh, thing we uh, experienced uh, was uh, that we were forced uh, to make a settlement with uh, US aid, actually, because they accused us uh, to break uh, American law by doing material support of terrorism. And that was uh, because we were supporting young people uh, in Gaza joining a democracy course. And they said that by that, it could be called material support to terrorism. And it was an Israeli whistleblower 
that claimed that we had uh, um, broke uh, broken that law. Uh, and we we all the time, of course, disagreed to the to the fairness of the claim. But NPA, in the end, had to accept paying a settlement to reach closer. And that was due to the estimate costs and resources and time necessary to take this to trial. We had to conclude that the best decision for us was just to agree on the settlement. And it was really expensive. We had to pay 2 million US dollars. Uh, and that's uh, a lot of money for us, for a quite a small organization. And um, they saw that we broke American law because we did material support to terrorists by supporting young people in Gaza, joining a democracy course. Uh, and uh, of course, we felt it was uh, fully crazy. Uh, but uh, the risk of standing uh, in a New York court, it could be 10 times the money we had to pay back if you lost the case. We felt that we had no chance to do so. So we just had to uh, accept, make this settlement. And of course, after that, we had to have so many other accusations towards us because this is used as a proof of NPA supporting terrorists. So it happens um, again and again. And we see it now. We have problems with bankings. And they are uh, international banks see these old settlements saying, hey, NPA, they've been supporting terrorists. We can't have they as customers. We have pr problems with transferring money. We have international risks companies who says that, well, we can't cooperate with you. So it has definitely had uh, lots of hard consequences. Luckily, we had very good support from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, not in the specific case. Then they said, well, we can't do anything for you. But afterwards, they have definitely all the way said that NPA is a serious partner of us, one of our most important humanitarian actors, and we fully trust them. And they have continued working with us. And also our friends in the labor union, they have really raised their support to us so that we can continue working uh, in Palestine uh, as we have done before. But we have to stop working with USAID. We can't have any cooperation with USA anymore because the way they make their contracts means that it will be too high risk for us ever trying to cooperate with them again. So yes, it has, it costs us a lot of money, but it also costs a lot of resources on communication, on finance, on compliance, and we always face new accusations all the time. And actually, it also makes us a little bit afraid how, what can we say now? How can we work also in the time to come? And that makes them, of course, that's precisely what they want us to be. So in a way, we have to admit that the Israelis, they do succeed because we want to continue staying in Palestine. We want to keep up having the same partners and how to find the right balance. So one example is that when the accusations came towards those six organizations, for a while, we stopped our funding to Wabak. Uh, we, we weren't sure if we could take the risk and what the consequences would be. So we uh, now we are back again. Now we are funding them again. And now we also have started a fundraising for a new support so they can get new equipments after they lost everything in the ride just uh, a few days ago. But uh, it took some time before we decided should we take the risk. Can we do so? Can we safely do so? And what will be the consequences for us? It's like we had said, it's not for the safety of our staff or anything like that. We are sure that they are safe and they are not the ones that will be attacked. But on the legal way, uh, what could be the next step that they take? Because I agree with so many of you have said that since the international society don't react hard enough, the only thing Israel have understood that they can take the next step and the next step and the next step. And we are a little bit worried what comes after this. Uh, but uh, we have to stand together with our partners. Of course, we have to do so. But yes, it's uh, lots of consequences. Thank you. 
Thank you, Henriette. And I think you brought up at a very important dimension, um, which is the, you know, and part of the objective, I think, of these false accusations is to cut uh, uh, the source of funding for, you know, these organizations and other organizations. And uh, what's important to note is, is you know, this have, having an effect on international financial institutions, banks that are closing accounts, that are refusing to, to open accounts. So there is a, a definitely a heightened risk for all of our organization, the whole of Palestinian civil society. It's very difficult to operate these days uh, because the Palestinian banking system depends on the global banking systems and on the Israeli banking system and economy. And so uh, many of, you know, of, of the organizations today have to go around. And I think um, uh, the, the other side of this is the, I think the, you know, the use and abuse of the uh, counterterrorism laws. Uh, I think the Palestinian case is a very clear case of it has gone too far uh, for too long and too far. Uh, it's not only in the Palestinian context that this has been used and abused, but we have to see that we're also in a, in a context where terrorism is vaguely defined by Western countries. Uh, and then they do these, these laws that are cracking down on you know, uh, people who are fighting for their self-determination. Uh, and so everyone in Palestine today can be defined a terrorist in the US. And I think there is uh, this is an attack on all uh, the human rights community. It's very dangerous for all the movements and I think all civil society around the world because of the abuse of this uh, anti-terrorism, uh, you know, counter-terrorism legislation. And actually in the statement of the uh, EU member states and of uh, also the EU high uh, representative, Joseph Borrell, uh, there is a, you know, this, uh, this sentence and uh, I don't have the statement in front of me, but it basically says, you know, that these counter-terrorism laws shouldn't be abused for cracking down on human rights organizations. I think it's a bit too late for that. You know, I think we've been seeing uh, the shrinking space for civil society in many countries. And Palestine, I think, is, is really a heightened. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a definitely a, a climax of that. And I think it has to stop. I think the it's a responsibility also of, of uh, European governments, of the US governments, to change those laws. and. Uh, and the consequence of that is that many Palestinian organizations stop signing contracts with USAID, for example. That has been, you know, they've, they've anyway left uh, for a long time. And, and many Palestinian organizations refuse to, to sign agreements because you would have to kind of, you know, uh, vet every single person who would, you know, eat a chips at a workshop uh, on democracy. I mean, it had really become really absurd. Um, so all these dimensions are really important to uh, to keep in mind, and I think the the responsibility again of governments uh, is tremendous in protecting, because protection means also uh, protecting the the ability to operate. Um, so we have received, and we have like ten minutes, and we we have received a a few questions. Uh, one is is um, uh, you know maybe to you, Asil. Uh, I think it's uh, how you know could could some of the offices reopen, or are you still closed? Uh, you know, how are you planning to continue to work? Um, so can can you answer this? And I think there was another question of if you have material, uh, you know, uh, like the documents and the data that was uh, stolen or confiscated, uh, do you have backups? Like, how do you, I mean, obviously there are things that might be confidential, but, you know, how are you dealing with those, you know, issues of, of security for your own information also? Uh, to keep track of all the information you have on war crimes and crimes against humanity? Um, I think regarding how are we functioning now and what's our response, it's basically um, regardless of where are we located, uh, we're talking about a system of uh, since COVID, we've been actually a lot of organizations have been working online. So we are operating regardless of the location. There are act there are some difficulties specifically for organizations that had uh, materials and equipment confiscated. Um, but as discussed, there's also continuous support from our partners. So um, uh, we're actually trying um, to uh, remedy the, the damages that, uh, that have been done in order to operate our work. Um, I think the main negative impact at the moment is two negative impacts is that, um, also, Inas, you mentioned this, is to 
kind of um, the, the, the aim of this attack is to actually distract us from the main and core work we do and to put us on this um, offensive mode. Um, and so instead of um, Al-Haq, for example, going on doing the human rights uh, documentation on a daily basis and doing the advocacy work, which we're still doing, uh, but it's adding more pressure since we're also trying to do um, and operate with the Stand with the Six campaign. So it's adding more pressure on the staff of the organization to work on, on, um, on two fronts, I would say. But there's also the kind of pressure and, and uh, climate of intimidation of also having the staff um, knowing that we are under a threat of being in prison, unfortunately. Um, and the other layer, layer is also our security and our um, uh, the protection of our the files we work on and the, um, the data and, and communication we work on specifically regarding um, the victims that we document the cases to and, um, and, the, um, and the files we submit, for example, to the International Criminal Court or to the current um, International Commission, um, UN Commission of Inquiry and other accountability mechanisms. Uh, now, whether how are we backing up or um, uh, using our data, it's more of a confidential question. But I think uh, no one could operate under such circumstances. Uh, no human rights defender could operate under such uh, pressing the, the circumstances. And this is why the pressure should be on immediate um, actions. Now, it's like way too more for after some months of this designation, to just issue a state of condemnation. Um, and so the immediate action that like specific demand that we have is to resend the military orders and uh, to resend the designation. Um, and, and, and the more broader kind of ways to challenge Israel's impunity is to do these countermeasures and, and, and sanctions um, on Israel. Uh, including, for example, stopping, uh, freezing diplomatic ties, freezing um, arms trade with Israel, freezing the security trade uh, with Israel, um, stopping the trade with the illegal settlement enterprise. Um, and for specific countries, those could be with specific agreements that they're actually rewarding Israel with, with its ongoing violation and harassment with, uh, of human rights defenders in Palestine. The EU, for example, is re-signing um, this um, Association Council Agreement with Israel, which basically celebrates and has one of the provision that says that we are working because we have a mutual human rights um, record with, uh, with Israel, which Israel is not complying with, um, as we all know. So one thing that could be done is to basically stop these agreements. This is to send a message to Israel that it cannot continue uh, with all these violations and, and, and uh, systematic attacks on civil society with actually no price. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, I want to then probably uh, uh, give one minute to each speaker uh, to tell us um, what does this uh, accountability look like? What kind of measures? What thing? What are you expecting from uh, you know your respective governments, uh, EU governments, the US government, uh, third parties? What what can be some of these actions that we're talking about in order you know to make sure that one these organizations, the Palestinian organizations, are protected, but also that. Israel faces the consequences for its act. And on what you just said, Asil, I want to, to, I think, remind, and I think it's it's good for, you know, civil society and journalists who are listening to us to look further into this, but only between 2015 and 2020, just to give the number on Germany, uh, the value of, of exports, uh, you know, licenses, exports of military equipment to Israel uh, was 1.4 billion euros uh, only for Germany. So, you know, there is, a very also a responsibility because the equipment that is used by the Israeli military can be often a US equipment or European uh, equipment to crack down on organizations. So if you can tell us just in, in two, three minutes uh, that we have left, um, maybe starting with you, Francesca, about, you know, um, especially from what, what you said about like, you know, respecting the, the right of self-determination of Palestinians, what can, uh, today, you know, third parties do uh, first and foremost. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so uh, international law obliges, um, creates some obligations on all states. For example, there is the obligation not to support um, a state which commits uh, international wrongdoings, uh, not to extend, to, to um, ensure that the uh, illegal act Ceases, so it's brought to an end, and so this is these are uh, clear messages to the fact that international community, as Asel was was uh, um, indicating, should uh, reconsider all its uh, all its agreements with Israel unless Israel complies with in, with international law. But again, um, it's it's not just about. For sure, it's, it's, it's necessary now to protect the civil society. But then the civil society is also a reflex of how Israel uh, treats uh, the, the Palestinian people. So the, the overall illegality is to be tackled. Uh, and I, don't, I see no other ways than by ensuring the respect for international law. It's not, a, I mean, we are not talking of making exceptional rules for the situation in, in between Israel and occupied Palestine. No, it's just to apply the law as it stands and as it should apply universally. Thank you very much. Uh, Henriette? Thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, debated a lot uh, in Norway uh, for a long time now. Uh, and we are sure that we think that uh, the response from the foreign ministry has come too late and has been too weak. Norway has said that they prioritize coordinating internationally and do not want to do anything alone. So uh, that means they were together with EU on the 27th of August saying that they were deeply concerned by the rights, but we definitely think that's too weak. And we do need a clear demand on Israel to withdraw the terror designations uh, and let the organizations work freely. And different countries have to show that they are willing to put force uh, into that demand. Norway is today a member of the Security Council until the end of this year. And they have said that they will raise the case during the monthly meeting on the conflict in the Security Council tomorrow. But I'm afraid that still they will be way too soft and they will just doing the same. They will saying they are concerned, they are worried and all those words. And there will not be any specific demand. So I think that's what we need to continue pushing uh, our different national authorities uh, towards. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Riyadh? So I'm, uh, of course, also like like everybody here, almost to speak in, on on behalf of an NGO. Uh, let's not forget that NGOs are very often, and especially in Palestine, also the result of either the state or the occupying power failing to deliver certain services or guaranteeing or safeguarding certain rights. So I think your question, of course, is much, much larger than the question of those six, uh, respectively, seven organizations and uh, the, the Israeli attempts of uh, outlawing them. It is really, as I think Francesca said, a matter of um, law and decades of rights violations that haven't been attended to, that have pretty much gone unanswered. And I think had, they, had this not been the case, then... First of all, some of the organizations we were talking about today wouldn't even be in existence. Second of all, uh, then, then probably Israel wouldn't have felt emboldened to criminalize them. So I think what I would wish for from, from the German government, and I know there's a lot to ask in the, in the, uh, in the face of uh, special relations with the state of Israel, uh, where these relations should maybe be special particularly with the jewish people not necessarily with the state of israel but um that's maybe a particular confusion or mixing deliberate mixing up uh, partly uh, in germany i would wish that they wouldn't apply double standards that rights breaches uh, require a certain response and this response should be the same for every state thank you
Thank you. Thank you very much, Riyad. So I'll remove my hat of moderator for a second and also have you know, a couple of points uh, to conclude. Uh, also based on a question that was asked uh, that I just saw about the uh, Israeli legal system and, and, and why these organizations are not uh, you know, trying to go into the Israeli legal system to, to defend themselves. I think the, uh, the important thing is to, to understand that the Israeli legal system is not fair. Uh, it's made uh, just like the rest of the system. It's, uh, it's a system where uh, Jewish people have more rights uh, than Palestinian people. Um, we have to realize that uh, we have staff from these organizations that are still imprisoned, arbitrarily detained without any form of fair trial, uh, no charges. Uh, you know, our friend and colleague Salah Hamouri, who's a lawyer from Ad Damir and is also a French citizen, is still in prison. Uh, Shaza Ode from the uh, Health Work Committee, who is 60 years old and spent 18 months in arbitrary detention and was just released in June, just for working for uh, one of these organizations. Uh, so, you know, the, the Palestinians try sometimes to go to Israeli courts, uh, but it turns out that even until the Supreme Court, uh, as recently as a few months ago, the Supreme Court validated and greenlighted uh, expelling and, you know, ethnically cleansing a whole area in Masafir Yatta in the south of Hebron in occupied uh, Palestinian territory, uh, expel expulsing and, and demolishing villages. So the system itself, the legal system itself is validating, uh, you know, these, these legal approaches. And so my, I think my demand would be to uh, always, you know, question uh, when you receive official information from Israeli sources to question these information, because there has been uh, disinformation, there is misleading facts, and always trying to criminalize Palestinians. So I think it's time that such information is, is not taken for face value. Uh, it's time to question the, the, you know, the good faith of, of any Israeli actor uh, that is, you know, again, accusing uh, Palestinians. I think uh, this has to be uh, really important and, and also, of course, to listen to Palestinians and to listen to what they have to say. And, and so, you know, many of you might have, uh, you know, follow up questions, uh, comments. So uh, we are all available. I think, uh, you know, uh, all of us here, uh, Asil included and, and the people in the panel, I think we can share. Uh, I'm happy to share my contact details and al Haq has contact details. So you can always ask the organizations themselves uh, for, you know, if you need information. Uh, and so we'll be happy to provide uh, I mean, Medico International who, and, 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 and Norwegian People's Aid who have been co-organizing, I'm sure can give you some information, contact for, for follow-ups. Um, thank you very much for being with us this evening um, and for staying with us because we're still 100, uh, even if it's very late, uh, you know, it's 8.30 uh, for many of you in Europe and it's 9.30 here in, in, in Palestine. So thank you very much for being with, with you all for this uh, very, very uh, rich and interesting discussion. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to work and, you know, see you next time soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Get well, Francesca. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.